Let us turn to the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 6. Amen. Verses number 15 through 17. Amen. 2 Kings, chapter number 6, verses 15 through 17. And we're just going to believe that God's going to speak to us in the house tonight. Amen. How many believes that God's going to speak to us tonight? Amen. And when the servant of the man of God was risen up early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alice, my master, how shall we do? In other words, what he was asking is, what are we going to do? How many's ever been there? What am I going to do? And then verse number six said, and he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And verse number 17, And Elisha prayed and said, I, Lord, I pray thee, open the eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and when he saw, he behold, the mountains was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. Ain't it amazing the very thing that took Elijah out of here was now surrounding Elisha. Amen. The very thing he said, if you see me when I go, and we can remember the story of Elijah and Elisha. Elisha was taken away in a chariot of fire. The Bible said that Elisha was to get a double portion, amen, of the, what Elijah had. Amen. And now not only is Elisha in a chariot, but the Bible said there are chariots of fire that is compassed about around him. Amen. Will you just lift up your hands and hearts all over this place. God, we come to you tonight. God, we thank you for the opportunity of being in your house. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do in this service. And God, I'd ask that we not say anything that would go against your word or do anything that would go against your will. God, but speak to us tonight. Give us a word from heaven. God, that would change us and cause us to leave out of here different than we came. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor. And let everybody in the house say in Jesus' name, amen. And you can be seated. Give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. Amen. Just don't get comfortable. Amen. Just for a, a few minutes of your time, amen, I would like to preach on the spirit of revelation, the power of revelation. Amen. What is revelation? Revelation is when you get in the understanding of something that you did not know previous or something that you did not understand could happen. Have you ever just got a revelation, amen, of something that seems so hard and then all of a sudden you say, man, it was easy if I just step back and look at the situation, amen, and looked at it and let God intervene. Amen. Here was a man that uh, probably would do the same thing that you and I would do. Amen. He gets up, he looks out the window, and all he can see is the enemy. Amen. How many knows that's where some of us are right now tonight? All we can see is the enemy. All we can see is the hurt. All we can see is the confusion. All we can see is the financial stress. All we can see is the sickness. Amen. But can I tell you, when you let God begin to give you a revelation, all other things become irrelevant because you know he still is the healer. He still is the provider. He still is the El Shaddai. He still is the first, the last. Amen. You see, when I get a revelation, the Bible said that he, 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 what was like, how many of those God don't see the thing, same thing you see? How many of those he operates on a different level than what you and I operate on? Amen. That's why the Bible tells us, amen, when the enemy comes in like a flood, that the Spirit of the Lord was going to raise up a standard. Amen. You know what? Amen. My Bible tells me that God rides upon the flood. Amen. So when the enemy comes in like a flood, you better look out. There's an anointed headed your way. There's a revelation headed your way. There's a deliverance headed your way. All you've got to do is have enough faith to say, I believe but help my unbelief. Well, how in the world am I going to get out of this mess? Everywhere I look, the enemy's there. 
how in the world, Elisha, what are we going to do? Hey, man, if you know what Elisha did, hey, man, the Bible said Elisha prayed. Oh, what would happen if we just learned how to pray? Come on, the disciples come to Jesus. And he didn't say, Lord, teach me how to be a better singer. Teach me how to be a better preacher. Teach me how to be a better musician. But he said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Because I understand if I'm a prayer warrior, all of these other things are going to fall in line. I become a better anointed preacher. I become a, come on, God teach us to pray. Amen. Our problem sometimes is we got time for everything else. Amen. You see, the Bible tells us that if the law taught us what sin is, we wouldn't even have a clue what it was. And since, in other words, what he was saying, if you ain't got a revelation, you know why some people never get healed? They never got the revelation that they can be healed. They believe they got to walk around in the same dilemma that they've been walking around with years. Come on, for 12 years, this little lady with an issue of blood, amen, believed every doctor, uh, and believed every report. Uh, but there come a time that she got sick and tired of being sick and tired. I wonder if I'm talking to anybody in the house uh, that's just sick and tired of being sick and tired. Amen, if you say, God, i got to have something said within herself. She didn't tell nobody. How many of you got to be careful who you tell your dreams to? Not everybody wants to see you make it. I, I, I hate to bust your bubble. Hey Amen. But everybody don't want to see you make it in this thing. Hey Amen. There's some people that would rather see you die trying. Hey Amen. Then they'd rather see you thrive. Hey Amen. Be careful who you tell your vision, who you tell your dreams to, because everybody hadn't got the same revelation you've got. And there's some people when you begin to tell their be your dreams, they become dream killers. How many knows what I'm talking about? They got more. You can't. Well, you know you can't do that. That sounds about what they told Peter. You can't walk on water. Why don't you just stay in your little comfort zone? Why don't you just stay in the boat where you, you're comfortable there? You've been a fisherman all your life. Come on, the storm ain't going to bother you because you know how to direct the boat. Amen. But there comes a time you've got to get rid of the safety nets. Oh, come on, somebody. You've got to get rid of your comfort zone and you're going to say for me to go to my next level. I've got to get out of this place I'm in and I've got to start making strides toward him. As long as we're in a comfort zone of doing things that we know how to do. Can we just be honest? Sometimes we learn how to have church. We know how to clap our hands. We know how to stomp our feet. But do we know how to cast out devils? Do we know how to lay hands on the sick and see them recover? Do we learn, do we know how to walk in the anointing? Oh, come on, somebody. You say, what are you talking about walking in the anointing? When you get a revelation that God didn't call you to sit on a pew and fold your hands and look good. Amen. But God called you to get messy. God called you to get out of your boat and do things that you ain't even used to doing. Oh, come on, can I preach to somebody? This is a war, and war is always messy. Come on, God's looking for somebody that said, God messed me up, but give me a revelation. It's messy. There ain't nothing pretty about it. Come on, when you first got the Holy Ghost, most of us, there wasn't nothing pretty about it. You was crying and 
tears will flow. How many know what I'm talking about? And you, man, we had a gentleman in our church, 72 years old. Went to church every service. Never would get up and go to the altar. We, he had a praying wife. If you got a praying spouse, you better be, thank, thank God. He had a praying wife, and his name was Woodrow. Amen. And he had a pray, she had a praying wife. Amen. That was get up and say, even while he was sitting on the back pew. Amen. I want the church to pray that Woodrow would get saved before it's too late. How many of you ever got, got some of them people in your life? 72 years old. And I've watched him. The Holy Ghost would be so powerful. I'd watch him hold on to the back of that pew. And never would go to an altar. Oh, we'd plead with a Woodrow and we'd beg a Woodrow. But he never would make the no, I wouldn't even get up with. He would just sit back there. And I know we'll begin a midweek service. Uh, hey man, an old Bible study that's supposed to probably be one of your dry services of the week. There really wasn't a lot going on. Because in our mind, we picture what revival is, and it's everybody shouting and everybody running and everybody having, come on, there wasn't anything going on. And all of a sudden, to everybody's surprise, old Woodrow jumps up from the back of the church and walks down. He couldn't kneel, but we had, the, the, he sat on the edge of the platform. And old Woodrow lifted up his hands and tears began to flow. And it went long. He was slain in the spirit. And I don't know what God was telling Woodrow, but I could hear him talking. And he was saying, yes, I will. Yes, I will, Lord. I wonder if we could get anybody in the house tonight that would say, yes, I will, Lord. I don't know what you want me to do, but yes, I will. I don't know where you want me to go, but yes, I will. Oh, come on. When I get a revelation that it's that can God. How many knows that can God mentality always gets you in trouble? That can God mentality I'll cause you to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And the Bible said while they were walking around that he gave them manna from heaven. Mm. They said, I'm thirsty. And God didn't hesitate. He says, Moses, speak to the rock. And the rock gives out water. They said, we need some meat. And all of a sudden, quail begin to fall. We need some bread to go with our meat. And all of a sudden, man up from heaven. Begin. But the Bible said in Psalm 78, and they tempted the Holy One of Israel. And they said, can God? I wonder how many of us have seen God do some mighty powerful things. And then we still we say, can God? Come on, what you mean, can God? Can God restore my marriage? Can God fix my finances? Amen. Can God heal my body? Oh, no, come on, I've got a need, and I don't know if God can do it or not. Come on, Bible said I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I do not change. And God is in the business of walking in the young mess and doing what everybody else said couldn't be done. When I get a revelation that it ain't God, can you? It ain't can God fix me because there's a lot of us needs to be fixed. I know we go to church, we put on that pretty mask. Oh, we don't want to go in the mask. We've heard a lot of that in the last few months. Can I go ahead and step out of the boat and say something? We've been wearing masks way before that. Come on. No, it ain't a little string that you put around your ears. It's that smile you put on your face and you're hurting on the inside. 
hey man, it's going to church and it, acting like everything's okay. But your life is a wreck and your life is a mess. And you're saying, God, I need to be fixed. But I really don't know if you can fix this because of this. Hey man, I don't know if you can bring me out of this because look what I've done. Hey man, but you know what I like about God? God don't let you to fill out a credit application. Hey man, God don't try to pre-qualify you. He said, if you will, I will. If you will, I will. If you want to be whole, I'll make you whole. When I get the revelation that God had rather restore me than he had replaced me. See, some of us ain't got that yet because we think God wants to replace us. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, he'd rather restore you than he had replace you. Somebody said, well, there's somebody else that can do it, but they can't do it like you can. I, I, I was doing homeschooling with the kids the other day, and, and they was talking about sci uh, biology and amen, all this other stuff. And I learned something, that the, the giraffe is kind of like us. Gir have you ever seen that print on a giraffe? All the different spots. Scientists say, and they tell us that there's not one giraffe that's got the same pattern. Every giraffe has got a different pattern about it. Like the fingerprint of a human. Why? Because God made you unique. You're your own person. And you don't need to try to be like everybody else. Come on, you don't need to want to preach like everybody else preaches. You don't need to want to sing like everybody else sings. Just get a revelation that God wants you to be you. But we spend so much time trying to measure ourselves by everybody else. And the Bible said not to measure yourself one against the other. Hey, man, you know why? Because when you do, you're going to get very discouraged. Don't put a measuring stick up against yourself and then go measure somebody else and say they did this so I ought to be able to do this. Amen. When you get a revelation that you are your own person. You know why most of us miss our calling? Mm. Brother Jonathan, I was praying the other day and I just kind of looked at something. I was, I was studying about Stephen and he got stoned. And what I was studying about that, the Holy Ghost kind of spoke to me. And this is what he said. Amen. And don't get me wrong, Stephen was doing a good thing. But Brother Jonathan, if Stephen would have been doing what he was called to do, he may have not got stoned. Uh-oh. It just got quiet. Well, what was Stephen's calling? The Bible said that Stephen's calling was to be a deacon and to serve the tables. Amen. So that the apostles could go about ministering the word and doing the work of the Father. Amen. How many knows you're most effective when you do what God has called you to do and you quit trying to do what everybody else is doing? Yeah, 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 yeah. Stephen got stoned because he was preaching the gospel. But he left what he was supposed to be doing. I want you to think about this because Stephen, and if you study the life of Stephen, Stephen was a, 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 a was one of them that was a deacon that was to serve and give food to the widows. Amen. That was the calling of the deacons. Not to run the church, but to wait tables and to be a servant. And Stephen left his post. Yeah. And it cost him his life. Hey man, you don't hear this preach much because we preach about he got stoned and looked up in heaven and seen Jesus standing. Hey man, and all of us get goosebumps. Hey man, but how many knows the boat? You'll get better goosebumps when you learn to operate in the calling and get a revelation that God didn't call me to do that job. Hallelujah. If David would have been where he's supposed to be. In, amen. He was a man that was after God's own heart. But 
what would have happened if David never would have went on the rooftop and would have been on the battlefield where his calling was? How many of those, when you begin to operate outside your calling, when you begin to operate outside where God's placed you, hey amen, you're going to find yourself in distress. You're going to find yourself in problem. But when you get a revelation, I'm going to learn to grow where God planted me. Come on. Don't you think for an instant God made a mistake? God didn't make a mistake planting you where he planted you. The mistake was when I said I know more than what God knows, so I transplant. And until we get a revelation that we're more used and we can be more effective. I love playing baseball. I played all my life, but everybody ain't a third baseman. Everybody can't play the outfield. They can catch a ball every now and then, but that don't mean that's where they're supposed to be. You know why everybody ain't a third baseman? A third baseman is one of the hottest spots on the field. That's where you're going to get a lot of your major shots. And if you put somebody that ain't used to it, and you just look at them all casually and say, well, they're a ball player. They can play anywhere they want to play. Hey, man, not only are they going to cause the game, but they could get injured. And what's happened through the ages, uh, we say, well, they're just Christians, Pastor. So we'll just throw them out there. Hey, man, man, God said, I don't want you just to throw them out there. they got to have a revelation of where they're supposed to operate in the kingdom. Somebody said, why ain't we seen the great revival that was prophesied? I'm going to tell you why, because we ain't ready. We said, we're not ready. You know why we're not ready? Because we got players playing out of position. God spoke to me about five, six years ago, and he gave me a vision. And in this vision, I, I, I visualized a football team, brother, and... I'm not a football fan by any. I couldn't tell you one. All I know is a Hail Mary is when you go for it and hope to catch it. All them other plays I don't know anything about. I ain't never went that direction. But God showed me a football team. And inside this t football team, I seen them get in a huddle. And while they was in that huddle, I could see that quarterback begin to tell them things. And God spoke to me. And he said, do you see what's going on? And I, although I didn't really, the spirit began to talk to me. And this is what he said. That quarterback has given him instructions. And you know what he's telling them? You're going to go this way and you're going to go this way. And you've got to get in position. Because one of you is going to get the ball thrown to you. And you've got to get ready. Amen. You know what God's been trying to tell the church uh, for the last year? Come on. This last 2020 has been the greatest altar call that the church has ever had. God's trying to tell you to get in position. Get ready. Get a revelation of what I'm getting ready to do. Somebody said, well, pastor, preacher, you don't understand. Hey, Amen. look at all the chaos that's going on. Whoever thought Dr. Seuss would offend somebody? And Pee Wee the skunk, whoever that was, I don't remember him. They said he was all the time hugging on ladies. I said he should have run for president. That didn't cost you anything. Some of y'all get that. Amen. There's a lot of chaos going on. Everybody's offended. Come on, we live in a very offended world, man. Just everything just hurts my feelings. Amen. Dr. Seuss hurts my feelings. And he has more sense than Dr. Fossey. But it just hurts me so much. Amen. But somebody said, why is that happening? It's because God has set the church up. 
Uh, come on. Well, you'd have never thought in the United States of America pastors would be going to jail for preaching this gospel, but it's happening. And God's saying, I'm giving my church a revelation that you better get ready. I'm fixed to shake this thing. Come on. He said everything that can be shaken will be shaken. If you just play in church, you're going to fall by the wayside. Peter said, I'm going to shake this thing. God spoke to him and told me, he said, I'm going to shake it. And everything that can be shaken will be. That's why you got churches emptying out by the hundreds. Because there's a shaking. And people are choosing fear over faith. In other words, the Bible said to believe God and let every man be a liar. Let God be true. Somehow we got it in our minds. And fear, most of our battles that we fight, brother, is right here. Amen. Most of the battles that you're going to fight is going to be inside your head. Because the, the, Bible, the Bible tells us, amen, we've not fashioned not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Honey, it's coming to pass right before your eyes. But he said, when you see all this, don't hide out and get scared. Don't hit the panic button. But he said, I want you to lift up your head. Because your redemption is drawing nigh. Even at the door. I believe that we can see what was going on in heaven right now. I believe Jesus is getting ready to step out. And I believe he's getting ready to call his saints home. Amen. He said, you've been faithful over a few things, and now I'm going to make you ruler over many. You see, you never can have a revelation over something you ain't never told. Or nothing, something you ain't never read. Amen. There's, how many of those there's people that really don't believe that they can be healed? There's people that don't really believe that they can live for God. You know why? Because, and here's the dangerous thing. Romans said because they did not want to retain God in their knowledge. Because, and most of us don't quote that right before that. He said because when they knew God. It's a dangerous thing to know God and not retain God. And heaven knows I can know who God is but not retain God in what I do and the way I act. He said because they did not retain God in their knowledge, he gave them up the vile affections. Men, when men leave in the natural, how many of those are some things that nature teaches you? There's some things you don't have to look no further than nature to get a revelation. He said, for this cause, God gave up the vile affections and turned them over to a reprobate mind. The word reprobate, the word reprobate means void of judgment. What is void of judgment? In other words, you ain't got the discernment between right and wrong. And when you ain't got a discernment between right and wrong, everything becomes right and nothing becomes wrong. And how many knows that's the generation we're living in? He said they would call good evil and evil good. I told my church the other day, and I think Brother Nathan was there. I was, I was seeking God. I said, God, how is it? 
How is it that you told him there's going to be people that's going to stand before you and say, did we not cast out devils in your name? Did we not lay hands on the sick and they recover? Preachers that prophesy. I hate to break a heart, but everything that's got a word, everything that's got a, a little black book ain't a preacher, ain't a prophet. Just as sure as I'm standing here, God spoke to me even while I was preaching that sermon. And God gave me vision while I was preaching last Sunday morning. I said, how in the world could that be? Because the Bible says they can, we know that the devil can't cast out demons. And they did it in your name. And God gave me a vision and I seen hands. And God spoke to me while I was preaching and I even told the church. He said, look at their hands. And there was blood that was dripping off the tips of their fingers. And he spoke to me and he said, I said in the book of Jeremiah, amen, that there was going to be the blood of innocence. I know some of you right now are thinking about abortion. But in the same instance, God spoke to me and said, churches have aborted more babies spiritually. Amen. In other words, there's going to be preachers that preach this apostolic, glorious gospel that's going to hell because they got blood on their hands. Yeah. They could tell you everything they was doing was wrong. They could point out every sin that you was doing, but they never got a revelation of the sin that was in their own camp which was a haughty and a high-minded and a self-righteous spirit that if you don't line up precept upon precept, you can't keep me, uh, you, I can't be a part. Amen, my God. I wish we had church houses that was full of drunkards and alcoholics. Uh, amen, and whoremongers that we could preach this glorious gospel. Most of your churches of the day are too holy. God said they'll be the very ones that said, well, God, I did it. But how many knows if you've got blood dripping off your fingers, you're going to be held accountable for every soul you drove from the church. Hey, Pastor, hey, man, every soul that I drove away because of my hardness and not having love and compassion, Lord, give us a revelation of love. Lord, give us a revelation of compassion. People slipped it through our fingers every day because we hadn't really got a revelation yet who God is. Because when you really get a revelation of who God is, the very essence of God. It's not holy. It's love. The essence of God is love. The wholeness of God is His character. That's who He is. He can't be anything else. Be ye holy. As your Father in heaven is holy. The problem is... God's holiness and your holiness might not match up. Because when you get a real good fit, God works from the inside out. I had a little girl call me several years ago. I said a young girl, probably 17, 18 years old. And she said, Pastor, she's a great singer. It sang like a mocking bird. And she said, I want to go be baptized in that lovely name of Jesus Christ for missing my sins. And I don't want to wait to church. I feel like if I don't do it now, I might not make it to church. Was her words. Thank God for an urgency. So I said, All right, we met down, me and some of the brothers and sisters from the church. I called them up, said, Meet me down at the river. Amen. Told him where we was going. We're going to baptize sister so and so in Jesus' name for the remissions of her sins. And can you believe at night, brother, Jonathan, that I let her sing a song? 
and because her hair hadn't grown overnight or because she hadn't learned she's still a baby and still learning to crawl amen there was people that literally drove her away from the church because they wouldn't let the pastor be the pastor because they wouldn't let God be God and give revelation you say preacher that's that's hard Watch this revival that God's given the church in the last days. You might ought to brace yourself. Well, why had you better brace yourself? Because more than likely they're not going to smell like you smell. They're probably not going to be wearing the clothes that you're wearing. They're probably going to look whirly as whirly could get. But God said, I'm going to go into the highways and the hedges. And you know why I'm going to do it? Because I got a lot of hard-nosed Christians that really ain't got a revelation of who I am yet. Amen. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to raise up a church that wasn't even of that pastor. And they're going to praise me. They're going to worship me. They're going to live for me. God, give me a revelation. Not of what I want to be, but who you want me to be. Not of what somebody's told me I need to be like. Somebody said, well, give me that good old time religion. And we, spoke, we sung that song for years and years. It was good for my granddaddy. It's good for me. It's good for his granddaddy. It was good for me. Coal oil lamps was good for him too, but we don't use them now. Horse and buggy was good for him too. I know because he told me all the stories. You say, what are you saying? I, I don't want what they had. Because what they had, it's not having to deal with the same devils that we're having to deal with right now. Somebody said, well, the devil, it's always been the same. I don't know what ain't. We're fighting a devil on a brand new level right now. Amen. Come on, there's devils trying to infiltrate on a brand new level. I don't want just what they had. I want more than what they had. I want a deeper walk in what they had. Come on, we're going to take it. me to say this for the Abernathy but 99% of your Pentecostal churches couldn't even tell you why their ancestors did what they did come on can we be a little bit honest well my daddy did it but why did your daddy do it it's kind of like the little girl that was standing in the kitchen hey man and her mother was cooking a ham and for some reason her mama got a knife out cut off the ends of the ham and she said why'd you do that she said I don't know my, grand my mama did it so she went to her grandmother and said, Grandmama, why do y'all cut off the ends of the ham? She said, I don't know, but her mother was just likely and still living. But said, that's what my, my mother did. So she went and talked to her great-grandmother. And she said, great-grandmama, can you tell me why y'all cut the ends off the ham? Mama does it. Her mama does it. And she said, the reason she done it, why you done it? And she said, well, baby girl, the answer is simple. When I was growing up, our pans weren't big enough. So I had to cut the ends off to make it fit. She said, well, why is Mama doing it? She said, I really don't know because she's got a big enough pan now to cook the whole ham. And sometimes that's the way we are. We don't know why we do the way we do. We ain't really got a revelation, and that's why we're easy stumped. That's when somebody really forces our hand and say, why do you do this? We throw it back on our elders because or we then get mad and go shouting how bad we've been persecuted. Well, so and so come against me. No, they just ask you a question because they didn't have a revelation. And if you ain't got a revelation of it, I don't need to be preaching it unless I can back it up, preacher, by the word of God, precept upon precept, line upon line. Our problem is, I'm trying to close, God's fixing to do something. 
we've got so hung up on our traditions and so much that some of us actually worship what we believe more than we worship Him because our religion as Pastor Hitch has said has become our God and when push comes to shove The Bible said, if anybody asks you a question, be ready at all times to have an answer. In other words, what he's saying, you need to get a revelation of what God really wants to do in your life. It's not God's real that Christians go around sad and depressed and broken. I ain't never seen a time in my life, but McKinney, in the last two years, last three years, that you got Christians, self-professed Christians, going around and you hardly ever see them smile. You hardly ever see any joy. Well, oh God, I got the Holy Ghost. But the devil's killing me. My Lord, I got the Holy Ghost. But when the world looks at us and we appear to be so depressed, Several years ago, I got invited over to a friend's house, me and my wife. And they had some good old deer burgers. And some people like them, some people don't. I found out if it's not mixed right, brother, it's nasty. And honey, if something ain't good, they can tell by looking at my face when I'm eating it. It's hard for me to pretend when I got something nasty in my mouth saying, whew. They sit there saying, How, how's that taste? Ooh, that tastes good. And you're looking for a napkin and hoping the dog's around. Thank God they did have a little dog that was under the table. And he got his fill in hamburgers. Because while they wouldn't look and I'd push one off in there. And they thought I liked them so well, they was trying to feed me more. I said, no, that's fine. Sometimes that's where we are with our spiritual walk with God. We want to tell people how good the Holy Ghost is, but they can tell we're not happy ourselves. We want to tell people how church is the greatest thing. And come on over and you're going to. But yet the attitude we have toward our church. And I just stop and say this, if this is your home church, this should be the greatest church you know. I'm going to say that again, Brother John, I didn't ask me to say it. If this is your home church, this should be the best church you know of. Because if it ain't the best church you know of, that means you're not really happy and you need to hit the door. Why? Because all you're going to do is stir the water and cause chaos. And you're not going to be happy. And somebody that ain't happy is going to cause everybody around them not to be happy. But if I say, man, that's the best church, and I do it with a smile on my face. That pastor's the best pastor I ever had, and I do it with a smile on my face. And I don't do it with that grimace on my face like I can't stand him anyway. Well, I better move on. When I get a revelation that if God planted me here, he didn't plant me here to be looking over the fence. He planted me here. And when I get the revelation that God wants to do something in my life, 